So, brothers and sisters, that brings us to the next topic of our convention for our PISC 2024. And the topic is Tawheed versus Shirk, the eternal battle. Now, when we were learning the Sirah of Islam, we were given the impression that because, there's, because Muslims today, alhamdulillah, there's no more idols, we no longer worship idols, there's no more shirk. So we, we see these stories in the Quran, something that's recurring, there's always this battle against Tawheed and shirk. And sometimes we think, that, oh, alhamdulillah, there's no more shirk. But in the re reality is, if we really, really look on the ground, there's, the war is still very much raging and it's right here, sometimes in our own very backyard. So one of the pages I highly recommend all of you to visit is the Pearlis Wisdom Plus. Okay, Perlis Center of Wisdom. It's also through the uh, official state, Mufti, Mufti State uh, Department. So in this page, mashallah, they uncover a lot of practices within our local cultures that actually have very, very serious practices that lead to shirik or some of them are outright shirik. Okay, so that's Perlis Wisdom Plus or Perlis Center of Wisdom. I believe they also have a booth outside. So Alhamdulillah, that brings us to the next topic of our discussion a battle in which rages on and on again throughout the Qur'an, throughout the history of Islam. And for this, with the topic of Tawheed versus Shirk, let us welcome our next speaker, Sheikh Asim Al-Hakim. I could be asked, what did you think? He thinks that the word Tawheed, because it's not mentioned in the Quran, we should not address it. And he made a fuzz out of it. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala al-mab'uuthi rahmatan lil alameen. Nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man ihtada bi hadihi wa stanna bi sunnatihi ila yawmiddin. Amma ba'd. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. By now, I believe, alhamdulillah, khalas, you're saturated with tawheed. So mashallah, now, after yesterday's lecture in Shaykh Wasim's, khalas, yani tawheed is something in your DNA, in your bloodstream. But to re-emphasize the importance of Tawheed, the Prophet ﷺ told us that the Jews were divided into 71 sects and the Christians were divided into 72 sects. And his ummah, the Muslims, will be divided into 73 sects, all in hellfire, except one. And the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, identifying this saved sect, may Allah make me and you among them, they are those who are upon my footsteps and my companions. These are the one, or this is, the sect that will be saved. Now, when we say 72 sects, do we mean Hanbali, Shafi'i, Hanafi, Maliki, and the likes? No, these are not sects. These are schools of thought. The sects relate the 72 to Aqidah, to conviction and belief. So the Rafida is definitely from them, 100%. The grave worshippers are from them. The amount of innovation, because bid'ah is divided into two types. Bid'ah that takes you out of the fold of Islam and bid'ah that does not take you out of the fold of Islam, but it's a major sin and you're sinful and you'll be punished and tormented in hellfire because of that. So among the 72, there are those definitely who committed bid'ah that nullifies their Islam. Those who deny Allah's beautiful names and attributes. This is kufr. Those who 
also deny the predestiny, the divine decree. Those who deny that Allah does not create our evil deeds, like the Jabriya and the Qadariya and the likes, they come and say, Allah does not create our evil deeds. Who creates it? There is only one creator. Are you crazy? Allah created everything in this universe. Allah says in the Quran, Wallahu khalaqakum wa ma ta'amaloon. Allah created you and what you make and do. So this is bid'ah mukaffira, takes you out of the fold of Islam. So definitely it's part of the 72 sects. And those who do bid'ahs but remain within the boundaries of Islam, they're committing a major sin and they're part of the 72 sects, but they will not be in hellfire for eternity. They will be purified in hellfire until they consume all their bad deeds and bad innovations. Once they're purified, Allah Azza wa Jal with his mercy and grace will take them out of hellfire, dip them in the river of life, restore their physical characteristics to be normal and then admit it to Jannatul Naeem. May Allah Azza wa Jal protect us. Now, having said this, the fight between Tawheed and Shirk has been ongoing for a very long time. Since the time Allah Azza wa Jal created this earth and what's on it, when Satan decided to take the side of Shirk and Kufr and disbelief and went against Allah's commands, and shirk continued and will continue until the day of judgment. When Adam descended to the earth, peace be upon him, people were upon Islam for 10 centuries, as the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam. Whether these centuries are a hundred years each or a generation that we do not know how long it is, it doesn't make a lot of difference for us. And the Muslims are so fascinated by details that they are distracted from the main target. They say, Sheikh, just tell us please, were they a hundred years? or not. The dog that was with the youth in the cave that Allah mentioned, was he a German shepherd or a Doberman or maybe a Chihuahua? Akhi, why are you asking these questions? He said, no, 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 we have to know. This planet which Prophet Ibrahim showed his people that he cannot be a god. He saw a planet, this is my god. No, it's too small. This is a planet, the, the moon is, is my god. No, it's too small and it goes away. The sun is my god. No, it faded away. My god does not fade away. So, Sheikh, tell me please, this planet, was it Venus? Was it Mars? Was it Uranus? A'udhu Billah, cover Uranus, Akhi. <laughs> Don't mention these things here, this is a family show. So what was it? Akhi, it's none of your business. Allah did not tell us about it. It has no importance to it. So why should you care? Therefore, 10 centuries, whether generations or a thousand years, they were all upon Tawheed, upon Islam until the time of Nuh, peace be upon him. His people were misled by Satan, big time. And this is how Satan works. Satan is very, very patient. 
He's not in a rush like me and you. He's willing to wait a year, five, ten, a century, ten centuries. But once you fall, you will fall hard. And you have to understand how Satan works if you want to save yourself from falling into fitna, from falling into haram. But this is not our topic because we have a specific thing to address. I just woke up, so <laughs> I'm enjoying my time and drinking coffee. So after 10 centuries, there were five righteous men that worshipped Allah, guided people, good scholars. When they died, the people fell very sad. And this is how we feel when our scholars die. We feel regret and sad. There used to be a beacon of light that we used to seek in the middle of the night. Now they're dead. So they felt sad. So... Satan whispered in their ears, why don't you build statues so that whenever you see them, you remember them and you go and offer night prayer and you fast and you do good deeds like they used to remind you. They looked at one another and said, that's a good idea. Bismillah. And they uh, uh, asked Da Vinci, not to make the Mona Lisa before the Mona Lisa, to make these uh, uh, beautiful sculptures on their graves. So people, mashallah, for 100 years, they see these sculptures, they go and pray and make dhikr and, 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 and go attend circles of knowledge. After this generation died, a new generation came and they said, hmm, these sculptures, why are they there? Satan said, because they are the reason you are getting rain. You have to go and worship them. You have to sacrifice for them. You have to always ask them and make dua for them. And this is when shirk started on earth. Allah says in the Quran, and they've said, you shall not leave your gods, nor shall you leave what? Nor Suwa', nor Yaghuth, nor Ya'uq, nor Nasra. These are the five idols that they used to worship. And hence, in our religion, it is totally prohibited to make sculptures, to draw living things. Sheikh, do you think I'm going to worship Mickey Mouse? Yeah, what's wrong in having sculptures or this and that? This is how Allah Azza wa Jal, this is how Sharia, this is how our Prophet Asalam protects the borders of Tawheed. Not even to get close to somewhere, some time. We see this in old soap operas, Arab soap operas. When someone dies, the wife comes to his portrait with black cloth on the wall. And he said, my husband, you don't see what the children are doing to me. People want money from me. And she speaks to what? To the dead. And this is only a portrait. How is it to be if it's something more and more? And this is why Allah Azza wa Jal prohibited making of sculptures. For the sake of Tawheed. The fight has been going on. For the sake of Tawheed. Nuh took his stance. Peace be upon him. 950 years he's calling his people. What kind of patience did he have? I give da'wah for five minutes to an atheist. He gives me allegations. I feel fed up. I said, you're right. Khalas, go. Go to hell. Literally, go to hell. I'm not old enough to speak with you that long. My life on earth is very limited. I have little time. I can't waste. No. Imagine 950 years giving da'wah to people who are not willing to listen or obey him. At the end, what did they say? They accused him of being insane. The people of Nuh denied before them. And they denied our servant and said, 
a madman and he was repelled. Allah says, كَذَّبَتْ قَبْلَهُمْ قَوْمُ نُوحٍ فَكَذَّبُوا عَبْدَنَا وَقَالُوا مَجْنُونٌ وَزْدُجِرٌ And not only that, they extended the threat into assassination by torturing him and hitting him with stones until he dies. They said, if you do not desist, O Nuh, you will surely be of those who are stoned. For the sake of Tawheed, Ibrahim, peace be upon him, took a stance when he was a young man in his teens, stood in front of everyone in his tribe and country because he had the backing of Allah Azza wa Jal. He was revealed to. I don't want any of the youth now standing up and said, I am like Ibrahim. I'm going to kill. I'm going to destroy. I'm going to blow up places. Hey, wait, wait, I'll put you in jail, Akhi. What are you doing? He said, no. Ibrahim saw the evil and he fought against it. He said, Ibrahim was given the message of Allah. Do you have a message of Allah? No. But shaitan is giving me these ideas. Then you have to pay for it. No, this is not permissible. Ibrahim, for the sake of Tawheed, stood in front of all of his people to the extent that they built a huge inferno, a huge fire, a big furnace. They say that birds flew way up in the sky and fell barbecued because of the heat. So horrible. And they threw him in the fire. Was he frightened? Never. What did he say? Good morning, Perlis. What did he say? Sleep. Drink coffee. Huh? wa ni'm al wakil. Hasbuna means Allah will suffice me. I don't need anyone. Wa ni'm al wakil is the one I trust and rely upon. So they threw him in the fire. But what did Allah do? Allah says in the Quran, they said, burn him and support your gods if you are to act. We, Allah said, O fire, be coolness and safety upon Ibrahim. For the sake of Tawheed, Ad accused their prophet, Prophet Hud, peace be upon him. Of being insane. We only say that some of our gods have possessed you with evil insanity. For the sake of Tawheed, they wanted to assassinate Prophet Salih. Who's the tribe of Prophet Salih? Who's Salih? This is problematic. Anyone? Salih is a messenger of Allah. Who was his people? Thamud. And before Thamud, there was Ad. And their messenger was names Hud. So remember these names. Hud and Salih. They are messengers of Allah Azza wa Jal. For that, they wanted to assassinate Salih. And Allah says, they said, take a mutual oath by Allah. They're idol worshippers, they're disbelievers. Yet they say to one another, take a mutual oath by Allah that we will kill him by night, he and his family. Not only him, we will assassinate his family and children as well. For the sake of Tawheed, Musa, peace be upon him, tolerated the injustice, the abuse, the ridiculing of Pharaoh who accused him of being unable to speak fluently, unable to communicate well, and accused him of being insane. He says, or 
Am I not better than this one, referring to Musa, peace be upon him, who is insignificant and hardly makes himself clear? He accuses him of not being eloquent and cannot speak fluently. And then Pharaoh said, indeed, your messenger who has been sent to you is insane. And so many messengers of Allah were accused by so many bad things. All combined in our Prophet salam's fight against shirk. For the sake of Tawheed, our Prophet wasallam suffered equivalently to all what these messengers had suffered before him. They, he was accused by being a sorcerer, a liar, a soothsayer, a madman, and that what he had brought them was nothing other than legends. And they say, legends of the former people which he has written down. The fight between Tawheed and Shirk, between truth and falsehood, will continue till the day of judgment. And each and every one of us would have his share in this fight, but we may not see it visibly. We may not, may not see the border lines clearly because shirk and kufr is so intermingled in our societies and communities, sometimes in our own household, that we don't notice it. Unfortunately, we so indulge in this life that we fail to see what is obvious so many times. There will never be victory for the Muslims. Imagine if they just quote this and they put it on the media. The Sheikh Wahhabi Sheikh says there will never be victory for the Muslims. No, don't, don't please edit this huh, for the cameras. There will never be victory for the Muslims unless they go back to Tawheed. Look at the Muslim history. Failure after failure. Loss after loss. This is what we see. However, there are shining years and events where the Muslims were the head of the whole world. And this will happen again, bi'idhnillahi azza wa jal. This is the promise of Allah to you. Providing you establish Tawheed. Listen to this beautiful ayah. وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَيَسْتَخْلِفَنَّهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ كَمَا اسْتَخْلَفَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ وَلَيُمَكِّنَنَّ لَهُمْ دِينَهُمُ الَّذِي ارْتَضَى لَهُمْ وَلَيُبَدِّلَنَّهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ خَوْفِهِمْ أَمْنَ يَعْبُدُونَنِي لَا يُشْرِكُونَ بِي شَيْئًا Allah has promised those who have believed among you and done righteous deeds that he will surely grant them succession to authority upon the earth just as he granted it to those before them and that he will surely establish for them therein their religion which he has preferred for them and that he will surely substitute for them after their fear security. How? Allah says, for they worship me not associating anything with me. This is Allah's promise in the Quran. You believe Allah, Allah will grant you this victory. Allah will grant you this security. Allah will grant you this sovereignty over the whole earth because it's his and he is the most powerful Azza wa Jal. Unfortunately, look at the Muslims around you. Iblis, Satan, has succeeded and managed to infiltrate them big time in their religious affairs until they associated others with him while thinking that they're doing well. Allah says in the Quran, and most of them believe not in Allah except 
while they associate others with him. We believe in Allah, but unfortunately we associate others with him. This can be clearly found in grave worshipping, in believing in the awliya and their ability to control the universe, in believing in the Prophet والسلام, being hadir, nadir, able to control the universe like he controls the palm of his hand. This is a sect found in, Islam, in, in, in the Muslims and attributed to Islam. This might be hidden, the shirk, when we pray and we beautify our prayer so that people would, MashaAllah, his recitation is good, MashaAllah, his, there is much khushur. We, play, we pray in our homes from zero to 60 in two seconds, faster than a Tesla. But when in the masjid, doing tahiyyatul masjid, and you hear the bones cracking and mashaAllah, tabarakallah. What is he doing? Is he flying? This is khushur? No, this is showing off. You're showing off because there are people watching you. This is minor shirk. And it can get bigger and bigger depending on your iman and on your knowledge. And this is why, and most of them believe not in Allah except while they associate others with him. Today, as Muslims, if you see someone killing someone or stealing his money or consuming haram, intoxicants or doing drugs, people would not stand still. They will interfere and they would speak against this evil and they will try to force it to stop, which is a very, very good thing. Alhamdulillah, we still have some Iman in our hearts. But all of these things are not considered to be a big thing when compared to shirk. And I hope you agree. All of these things can be forgiven. If you kill someone, you will go to hell. But this sin, killing, intoxicants, fornication, all major sins that we know that are major sins and eventually you will be tormented in hellfire to expiate your sin, all of them fall under the divine will. On the day of judgment, if Allah wills it, I forgive your sins, go to Jannah. No hell? No. This is in Allah's hands. You can never know if you're going to have this favor or not. But if you come on the day of judgment with a grain of shirk, this is not forgiven at all. And nowadays people, when they see people doing major sins, they fight against them and they stand in their faces. But when they see them doing shirk, may Allah guide them. They don't try to stop this shirk. You don't, you don't see people giving advice to grave worshippers or to those who make tawassul by the Prophet والسلام, or by the righteous deceased or awliya or salihin. Allah Azza wa Jal says about those who invoke the dead. And who could be more astray than those who call upon others besides Allah? Others that cannot respond to them until the day of judgment and are even unaware of their calls. Whoever commits shirk, even if he were to be a messenger or a prophet, he will abide, he will go to hellfire. Allah says, indeed, he who associates others with Allah, Allah has forbidden him paradise and his refuge is in fire. And if you look nowadays where we do not have prophets and messengers anymore, you would find that there is a similarity between our times and the times of the messengers and the prophets, peace be upon him. The same rhetoric, the same ridiculing, 
the same labeling that was done with the messages of the prophets is done today with the righteous followers of the prophets and the messengers. They accuse them and they label them with so many things. Righteous, practicing, knowledgeable Muslims upon the aqidah of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. What are they accused of? Oh, they are extremists. They are fundamentalists. They are from the Stone Ages. They are Wahhabis. Why? Simply to discredit you. There is no sect on earth called Wahhabi. There is nothing as Wahhabism. Nothing. It does not exist. But people lie and they believe their lie. So at the end of the day, they said, oh, you are a Wahhabi. Why? Because you don't go to graves. Because you don't rub righteous people for barakah. It's not a magical lentil or, or something. A, a genie would come out. People say, barakah, sheikh, barakah, sheikh. It's white. Now look at it. It's black. <laughs> Wash your hands at least. Use a sanitizer. So what is this concept? It is the concept of shirk. Whatever you oppose it, you will be labeled like the messengers and prophets. You're a Wahhabi, you're a fundamentalist, you're an extremist. You're not sharing the bid'ah with us. You are this and you are that. This, by the way, is the test that Allah gives to everyone on earth. Each and every one on earth. On earth blah, blah, blah. Edit this, please. Okay, let me repeat again. This is the test that every one of us is going to get on this earth. Each and every one is going to be tested. And this test is mentioned <coughs> in the Quran. Allah says, Alif Lam Mim, Ahasiban Nasu Ayyut Raku Ayyakuru Amanna Wahum La Yuftanun, Wala Kada Fatan Ladina Min Kablihim, Fala Yalaman Allahu Ladina Sadaku, Wala Yalaman Al Kadibin. Do people think? Once they say, we believe that they will be left without being put to the test. We certainly tested those before them. And in this way, Allah will clear, clearly distinguish between those who are truthful and those who are liars. This is cascaded throughout history. And the test has to be hard and difficult. Don't think that the test will be easy. If I am a rich billionaire and someone comes and says, Sheikh, we have a madrasa, we have a school, we need a bus to take the orphans and the students to uh, uh, their quarters. And I give him 200, 300, 500, 1 million ringgit. Is this a problem for me? No, it's not a problem. There is no test in it. There is no test in it because I have a lot of it. My test would be if I wake up half an hour or an hour before Fajr and I feel like I have to spray tahajjud. As a billionaire, I'd rather pay Sheikh so and so he pray tahajjud for me. No, the test is for you to go and make wudu and pray. To fast Mondays and Thursdays. Oh Allah, fasting, I have a business meeting. I have a luncheon. I have this and that. I love eating. This is your test. So Allah tests each and every one with what is a test that is difficult, that is hard. A Muslim woman would be tested with a horrible husband who's abusive, who's rude, who never sends her love messages, who never compliments her beauty, who never connects to her family. This is hell to a Muslim sister. This is her test. I could say the same to the men, but then the sisters would hate me and I would not think that this is appropriate at the moment because the fight is between Tawheed and Shirk, not between man and wife. So the idol worshippers at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, they disbelieved him and accused him of lying like the previous nations before Muhammad ﷺ. Why do they lie? Why do they disbelieve? 
Why do they reject the truth? What is the messenger calling you to do? Give him money? No. He's not asking for anything for himself. He's asking for righteousness, for goodness, for high moral conduct, for everything that would get you and bring you goodness in this life. Why are you rejecting him? Number one, because of arrogance. It's the arrogance in the heart. Allah sent you? Couldn't Allah find anyone better than you? Arrogance. Envy. No, no, it should have been me, not you. That's why I will never ever believe you. Like Abu Sufyan said, or sorry, Abu Jahl said, Abu Jahl, along with two other idol worshippers, used to stay at night listening to the Prophet ﷺ in Mecca, reading the Quran in Salat. And when he met with the other two, they said, you're listening to? You're the head of the disbelievers and you come stealthily at night to listen? He said, yes, Allah, this is the truth. <laughs> what he's saying is the truth. Quran is the truth. And they were shocked. Said, Why don't you believe? He said, how can we believe? My tribe and Banu Abdul Muttalib's tribe, the Prophet's tribe, we were competing for hundreds of years. They give money, we give money. They give charity, we give charity. They give water and food to the pilgrims, we give water and food to the pilgrims. We are like racing horses. Competing for honor and pride. But now, one of them comes and says, I get revelation from the heavens. How can we compete with this? No, wallahi, I will never believe in him. This is envy that is found. And this is found till date, unfortunately. There is this collaboration between the Jews, the Christians, the secularists, the hypocrites, the Orientalists. All of other forces than Islam collaborating on you. Because you support the side of Tawheed. And they support the side of Kufr and Shirk. And likewise, the people of Ad, the people of Thamud, they had done the same thing. Do you know the people of Ad? Who's their messenger? Huh? I don't know what you say. I need a crystal clear name. Hud. Masha Allah. Tabarakallah. What a good lecturer I am. Masha Allah. Tabarakallah. Very good. So Ad, their prophet Hud came to them. Now, a small lesson of history. The first nation after the people of Nuh was Ad. So whenever you get a quiz, maybe you get a hundred ringgit prize. Remember me. So, the people of Ad came after the flood. And Allah gave them so much and favored them with huge bodies, with civilization, with engineering ability that was way, way before their time. Yet, they were amazed by their own civilization so they rejected Allah's favors and blessings Allah says in the Quran then do you wonder that there has come to you a reminder from your Lord through a man from among you that he may warn you this is addressed to the people of Quraysh and remember when he made you successors after the people of Nuh and increased you in stature extensively. So remember the favors of Allah that you might succeed. And this was addressed to the people that took extensive measures to boast about their power. Allah Azza wa Jal says, do you construct on every elevation a sign amusing themselves and take for yourselves constructions, places, and fortresses that you might abide eternally? These people used to build houses on the top of mountains, not to live in it, 
just like something to be amazed of. When you come and pass, you say, wow, what a huge building that is. In mountains, how did they carve it? How did they build it? How did they reach that place? They were giving offsprings. They were giving wealth. They were giving gardens. Everything was perfect for them. Yet, they continued to disbelieve and to associate others with Allah. And when they persisted in doing so, Allah Azza wa Jal sent His wrath upon them to annihilate all of them. And so Allah says, And as for Ad, they were destroyed by a furious, bitter wind, which Allah unleashed on them nonstop for seven nights and eight days. So that you would have seen its people lying dead like trunks of uprooted palm trees. Their huge bodies that was, that was almost 60 foot high. Imagine people being six foot high. That's nothing. Lots of people are six foot high. They were 60 feet tall. 60. And some of them reached the height of 90 how many stories, how many buildings, you know this height. This is how they were. And for seven nights and eight days, this cold, terrifying wind came to them. And you could see them lying dead. As for Thamud, this is the tribe that came immediately after them, after Ad. Who was their messenger? Salih. Allah sent to them Salih. Salih kept on asking them to yani, believe in Allah. Look at the tribe that was before you. Look at Ad. They're recently close to you. You can see what happened to them. And the tribe of Thamud were known to be great architects. And you can still till, see till date their heritage carved in mountains. When you look, yeah, we can't do this with our technology today. We can't at all do this laser and bombs and nuclear bombs. Nothing can do this man magnificent art. Magnificent art. Yet, they used to do these houses. And they lived in them when it was winter and cold. Because no rain could affect it. And in the summer, they go to the valleys where they can farm and trade and live as they wish. So he came to them, reminded them of Allah. What did they say? No, not interested. He said, what do you want me to do? I'm just telling you to worship one God, one Allah Azza wa Jal. They said, listen, you want us to believe you? Look at this rock. And there was this huge rock. This is their bread and butter, rocks and mountains. So this rock, we would like you to blow it up, put your explosions or whatever. We want you to get out of it a she camel, a big, beautiful, wonderful camel. Not only that, it has to be pregnant. And we would like to drink from its milk. So he says, and if I do this, would you believe me? I said, yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> Come on, do it, do it. And they're making fun of him. And he took pledges from them and oaths that they will believe him and they will worship Allah. He asked Allah for this miracle. And Allah Azza wa Jal made that rock split into two. And there came this wonderful, beautiful, amazing she-camel that was pregnant. This guy said, whoa, this is too much. This is not what we were bargaining for. Man, the guy is saying the truth. Now, here comes the condition. He says, you want to drink from the, from the milk? Not coffee, sorry. You want to drink from the milk? Allah Azza wa Jal says, one day... You do not drink water from the well. 
This day is entirely reserved for the camel. It drinks from it the whole day. But in return, you get to milk the camel and drink and keep and store whatever you want. The whole entire country, city, village, tribe. On that day, they milked and they put in pots and they put in their refrigerators and they stored a huge amount of milk. And milk is milk. Something that you can feed upon for ages, not needing anything else. And the other day, they can drink water normally and business as usual. That's a fair deal for something like this, a miracle. After a couple of weeks, and nope, not interested. We want water. We don't want milk. Okay, what about the pledges, the oaths? They said, no, we don't want this. So they kept on in defiance and in disbelief and in kufr and shirk until they went and plotted to slaughter that camel. Allah told them, do not touch it, do not harm it. Yet they did not comply and they went and slaughtered it. When they did this, his, their messenger, Salih, told them, well, the, you are about to be annihilated and tormented. And Allah Azza wa Jal sent upon them, and this is not the time, but again, sent a warning for three days and nights. And then they died by the shout that had the sound of a thousand thunders and the trembling of the earth. And they were over as if they did not exist. A whole nation was wiped off the earth. But Allah kept their homes as a trophy, as a reminder for us to see it. However, the Prophet said, alayhi salatu whenever you pass by, you should not go in because you will be tormented like them. If there was no other way, then pass by quickly and swiftly while being in the state of fear that may the punishment of Allah fall upon you and you don't want this to happen. I will conclude with the last story of today, if you're still awake. And this story is not by a messenger, but rather by righteous people like you and me. In Sahih al-Imam Muslim, Suhaib, may Allah be pleased with him, narrates that the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam once was telling them a story of people, those who were before them. There was a king, and this king had a sorcerer. The sorcerer got old, so their HR, human resources, was quite good. So the sorcerer came and said, my king, I think I need a successor. And this is an HR called succession planning. So the king said, okay, look for some good candidate to take your place. So the sorcerer looked around and he found a young boy. And this young boy was smart, clever. So the sorcerer started to take him in and teach him his tricks. Every day from the way of the boy's house to the sorcerer's office, the boy passes by a monk. Now, again, people say, Sheikh, was he Jew or Christian? What was the religion of the monk? What was his madhab? What was his manhaj? Yeah, he's none of your business. Allah did not tell us about it. Move on. Khalas. So, he used to sit and listen to this monk preaching Tawheed. What is the monk going to teach? Nothing but Tawheed, the oneness of Allah. And he said, Wallahi, this monk's words are very captivating. They're very nice. I like listening to this. This is natural. But whenever he went to the sorcerer, he was late. 
So the sorcerer would beat him up. You're late and you're my student. And he beats him up. So the boy complained to the monk and he said, every time I come to you, I get a good whipping. So what should I do? The sorcerer said, no problem. When the sorcerer asked you why you were late, say to him, my family kept me for some errands. And when you come late to your family and they ask you why you were late, tell them that the sorcerer kept me from some homework. And it worked. So he kept learning from the Tawheed of the monk. One day while walking, he saw a beast. Whether it's a lion, it's a tiger, it's a dragon. I don't know. It's a dragon near, nearby. So he said, today I shall know whether the sorcerer is better or the monk. He took a stone, a rock from the ground and he said, Oh Allah, if the monk is more beloved to you than the sorcerer, Oh Allah, relieve the people from this beast's evil. And he threw the beast and the beast was dead. So now it was cemented in his heart that the monk is on the truth and the sorcerer is telling false, falsehood. So he started increasing in his powers till the monk said, when he heard about this story, he said, my son, I think you've reached a level that is much higher than mine. And your pay grade is way above mine. So if you became, if you were to become famous, please don't tell people about me that I was your teacher. Because then I will receive some form of torture and torment. The boy said, inshallah, Allah kareem. As his reputation grew, Mashallah, the, the story is captivating and people are awake. Mashallah. That's good. That's good. As his reputation grew big, everybody came to him. He's a righteous man. He's a man of God. The blinds came to him. He said, Bismillah. He cured them. The leopard came to him. Please help us. He said, I don't help you. It's not in my hands. But if you believe in Allah, I will ask Allah to cure you. They say, we believe in Allah. He said, Bismillah. And he rubs on them and they become well again. So he became famous. And the clinics went out of business. One of the escorts of the king, a minister or something, he became blind. So he went to him and he said, Oh, master. These are gifts and wealth and gold and silver. If you cure my blindness, it's all yours. He said, I don't cure anyone. It is Allah that cures people. Do you believe in Allah? He says, I believe in Allah. He said, Bismillah. And he wiped his eyes and he became able to see. Now, the logical thing to do is take the money and run. The escort did not do that. He went to the king. Yeah, you know what the king wants from you. What are you doing? It's like when watching horror movies and the kids go into the barn and you know that the killer is there. And you say, don't, don't do that. But they still go, go and they still get killed. So the escort went to his king and the king said, whoa, you can see now. And the man said, yes. He said, how... Was that possible? He said, Alhamdulillah, Allah cured me. And the king says, I cured you? Look how stupid the king is. He said, I cured you? He said, no, no, Allah, my God. And he said, you have a God other than me? Torture him. So they started beating the heck out of him until he confessed and said, the boy cured me with the will of Allah. So they brought the boy and they started beating him until he said, the monk is the one who taught me. So they brought the monk and they said to him, are you the one who believes in Allah? He says, yes. The king said, do you believe in me? The monk said, no. So they brought a saw that you cut woods with and they put it on the tip of his head. No anesthesia, 
Nothing. It's not, it wasn't even electrical. It was manual. I said, okay, Bismillah. One, two. And they started shipping him into halves until he died and fell. And he would not leave Tawheed. Then he did the same to the escort. Huh? Blind man. Now you're not blind. Are you willing to go back and believe in me? He said, no. And they did the same. And he was cut into two halves and not rejecting his faith. Then he went to the boy. But apparently he felt a little bit sorry for the boy. So he said to his soldiers, a bunch of commandos, take him and climb the highest mountain in our country. Once you reach the peak, tell him, will you reject your God and believe in our king? If he does not comply, toss him off. So they went up, 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 up. And then when they reached the top and they wanted to toss him off, the boy said, Allahumma akfinihim bima shi'at. Oh Allah, suffice me with what you will. Save me from them and protect me with what you will. And the Prophet says, والسلام, this is in, in Sahih Muslim. The mountain shook. They all fell from the top of the mountain except the boy. The boy climbed down and he walked to the palace. Knock, knock. Who is it? It's a boy. Come in. So he went in. And the king was shocked. He said, hmm. Where are your companions? Where are the commandos? He said, Allah Azza wa Jal sufficed me. This is ridiculous. Bring another squad. They brought another squad. Take him in a boat until you are in the middle of the ocean. And toss him. Let the sharks feast on him. They went. And in the middle of the ocean, he said, Allahumma akfinihim bima shi'at. And the boat trembled and capsized. They all drowned. And the boy came walking to the palace. The boy had a mission. He could have run away. He could have taken money with the powers he have and lived a luxurious life. But this is the fight between Tawheed and Shirk. When the man saw him, he was outraged. Where are your companions? He said, well, Allah sufficed me and got rid of them. The guy was out of ideas. The boy, his name is Abdullah. He said, listen, I'll, I'll show you a good way to kill me. If you want to kill me, gather all the people in our town in an open area. And put me next to a tree. Either crucify me or just tie me. I'll be in a target for you. And take an arrow from my quiver. Put it in the bow. And say loudly, Bismillah, the Lord of the boy. And shoot me in my temple. And if you do this, I will die. The king was... Out of his mind. He just wanted to kill. So he did exactly what he was ordered to do. He gathered all those who believed in him to be God. And they're listening. And seeing. Oh this is the boy that was causing problems. And chaos and rioting. What is the king going to do with him? Oh he's tying him up. Oh the boy is being a target for the king's practice. Oh, the, bo the king is taking a, an arrow, but not from his own quiver, royal quiver. No, from the boys. And the king said loudly, Bismillah, Rabbil Ghulam, the Lord of the boy. And the people were shocked. There is a Lord other than you? What is this? There's something wrong. And he shot the boy. It fell in his temple. He didn't die. The boy placed his hand on his temple and he died. The moment the people saw this said, We believe in the Lord of the boy. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. The companions of the king said, Whoops. Houston, we have a problem. What is this? What you were afraid of happened. The whole country is Muslim now. 
What should we do? He said, dig ditches in the ground and fill it with wood fire and put the fire on. And whoever from the whole country refuses, push him in. Let him burn. And those who believe in me, save him. So they started to do this. And the whole people of that village willingly walked into that fire that led them to Jannat al naim Willingly accepted to die rather than turn back to kufr and shirk. Because how long will you live? 60 years? 70 years? 90 years? Then what? Then death. To live with your head held up high with tawheed. To live fighting for your beliefs. To live with honor and dignity. Wallahi is better than to live forever without any tawheed in your heart. So they kept on pushing people and burning them and killing them until a woman came with her infant child. And you know how much a mother loves her infant. And when she came into the fire, she hesitated. Not for herself, for her child. And Allah made the child speak. The infant spoke and he said, Oh mother, be patient. You are on the right path. And she threw herself in the fire. To conclude, I think I've taken too much time. But at least I got you awake. To conclude, the fight will continue till the day of judgment. Everybody's anticipating. When is Mahdi coming? Well, I don't have his ATA. But he's coming. When is Jesus descending? He's coming. When is the day of judgment? Yaqi, why are you so eager about the day of judgment? When you die, your day of judgment is done. But if the day of judgment comes, you never know whether you will be among those steadfast on the truth or you will go and follow the Dajjal. So now you have a chance to learn your religion, to abide by it, to call people to it and to be patient on whatever may happen to you because of that. إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالصَّبْرِ I pray to Allah that he makes me and you among those who live upon Tawheed and die upon Tawheed and be resurrected in the highest levels of Jannah upon Tawheed. Wallahu a'lam. Wa nisbatu al-ilmi ilayhi aslam. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyyina Muhammad.